You notice I'm on the theme of clarity, making sure things are transparent. And I got to tell you, in 2004, we did the same thing you did in our district. We all went down to hear Rick and Becky. Yay! Great. We went and heard Rick and Becky. This is wonderful. It's absolutely spectacular. We were so excited. So we went back. We trained all our staff. We told them all about the, the three things that were important about PLCs. We taught them the four questions of a PLC. We had them do all that. And, and by the way, we got so good, we had all the teachers memorize the four questions. What do we want them to learn? How we know they learned it? What do we do if they haven't learned it? What do we do if they haven't learned it? And we sent them out and we said, go forth and PLC. And the teachers went out and said, what do we do? I know the four questions, but what do we do? So we quickly realized that we had not given them a roadmap, something they could follow when they got back to school. So I'm going to show you this flow chart, but I'm going to do it a wee bit different. You see, you can see how it works. So I need three volunteers. You made eye contact. You're in. You're in. You're in. Can I have you three come up here? You make eye contact when you're in. You just looked at me right here. <laughs> okay. So this is Tom, Jennifer, and Rhonda. Rhonda's the PLC facilitator for this team, and she's going to walk you through this flow chart. True? No. Here we go. What do we want all students to learn? The first thing we said is you have to find an essential standard. Not just any standard, but a really important standard. A standard that every kid needs to know. Uh, we'll make you a fourth grade team. And the standard that, that this team has chosen is order of operations. Order of operations important? Got a math teacher here? Order of operations important? How important? I'm going to tell you, you can't do algebra unless you know order of operations. So this team has chosen that. And that means that they need to have every kid in the fourth grade walk out of there knowing how to do order of operations if they're going to be successful in the previous, next grade level. True? So they're going to understand that standard. They're going to sit down, they're going to discuss it, and make sure they have a common understanding of what that standard is. And they're going to try to understand the expectations for that. But then, how we know they've learned it? They're going to build a CFA, a common formative assessment. And what Rhonda's done here, she's a genius. She's so bright. Rhonda's gone and she said, Tom, give me three questions on order of operations. She's asked Jennifer for three questions on order of operations. And she says, I'm going to put in four to create a 10-question common formative assessment. There's the test. Look pretty good. But here's what they look, learn when they look at that test together. Tom, oh my gosh, he writes the hardest questions in the world. Oh, my gosh, they're at university level for fourth grade. They are killer questions. Jennifer, she writes them at kind of a first grade level, like, do you like order of operations? That sort of question, okay? <laughs> and Rhonda, she goes to the state release questions. She pulls them out, she modifies them, and she puts them there. So now they have a 10-question test with all sorts of different stuff. What did this team just learn about themselves by learning, looking at that common formative assessment? Say it. They have different expectations. They have different expectations. Where's my math teacher? Which kids do you want next year? Well, I'm going to tell you, Tom, he failed half his class because they couldn't do it. Which kids do you want now? Folks, you ever had this? You ever done this? Which teacher did you have last year? You ever been there? Well, folks, that's a scary thought in itself. So what this team is doing is they're looking at and they're realizing their expectations and level of rigor are at all different levels. So they're going to go back and they're going to modify. They're going to adjust that and so they have a better understanding. Tom's going to come down a wee bit. Jennifer's going to come up a little bit. But they're going to create a test that, by the way, if the child passes this test, you will be guaranteed they know order of operations. True? Now, here's the other thing about this. In looking at this test, you have to ask yourself, why are they creating the test before they teach it? It gives them a target. It says, here's the target. And by having them come to agreement on that CFA, it provides a common target for them. So the next thing, before they move on, they're going to do a P&P. &P. They're going to set the proficiency and protocols for that test. 
So the proficiency. Tom, how many does a kid have to get right to say he's mastered order of operations? Eight. How many, Ron, Jennifer? Nine. Nine. Go ahead. Eight. Now, folks, you're going to see this all the time. In fact, Jennifer, because she writes them very easy, she may have said, well, you know, if they get too right they're, and they're happy, that's okay. But we need to come to consensus on the number that it takes. And it sounds to me like consensus-wise, can you buy into eight? She buys into eight, so we're going to set eight as the proficiency level. A child must get eight out of ten. How many days do you need to teach order of operations, Tom? Ten days. Ten days. Ten days. Folks, they've chosen ten days to teach order of operations. That doesn't mean they're just going to teach order of operations every day, but in a ten-day period, they will ensure that every child's mastered that. So we're going to put the date for the CFA on the 11th day. Folks, you always want to put it one day outside of the last person that teaches as long as it's reasonable. If you have somebody who says, well, I need, I need the first semester, that doesn't work. But 10 days in this case, I think it's a bit long, but they've chosen that. So they're going to put it on the 11th day. So the next thing, we've, dis- we've built our test, we've set the provisions, so we put the date of the test. But folks, there's a piece that teachers miss, and it's a big deal. The protocols, the rules for giving that test, those rules become critical because guess what? Tom, can you use calculators when you take your test? Yes. Can you use calculators? Yes? Okay, well, think about it. Do you see what just happened? What happens if they give that test and these two allow calculators and she doesn't? What happens to the results? Oh, I'll flat out tell you, I've seen teachers go nuts on each other over it because suddenly you cheated and I didn't. True? So, and particularly primary teachers, I have a kindergarten team in my district that we had to go in and actually make sure they did the protocols because then there was always accusations. Well, you did it this way. No, we do it this way. Get your protocol set. So we are going to use calculators, okay? Can you read the test to the kids? Yes, they can read the test of the kids. But folks, think about those type of questions as your team. Does that make sense?